So with the nicer weather, I hope you all have been taking advantage of the weather and the outside as you're able. Uh, for our family, we've been able to go outside and hang out with friends more uh, as the weather's gotten nice and as local vaccine rates have gone up. So of course, you know, with social distancing and that's appropriate um, and for your own, your own personal comfort level. Uh, spending out time outside and Earth Day being a few days ago and our seventh principle, um, I am eager to hear what Reverend Amanda and our youth have to say during today's service. And then after today's service, please join us for coffee hour. Um, information on that will be shared. The link will be shared during service and it's also in the email you received this morning. After service and throughout the week, please check out the other opportunities to gather with fellow UCAers. Uh, you can find information about that on our Facebook page as well as in our connections email so we can come together as a community. Apparently the, the kids find something funny, but I'm, sorry, I'm not really sure why. Uh, but because UCA, so UCA or UU holds that great good comes from wide diversity. So whoever you are, whomever you love, whatever your ability, whatever your heritage, and from wherever your beliefs spring, know that you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hugh, and thank you, Abby and Emily. And for those of you who didn't have sound at the beginning of our service, we're so sorry. We thank you for your letting us know and your flexibility. And I'm delighted that we had uh, this beautiful family to look at, whether or not you heard them. Rest assured that they offered a welcome this morning to each and every one of you whether you are on Zoom or watching on Facebook or on YouTube or on Vimeo or from the church website, however you are with us, we are so glad that you are here. I'd like to offer this morning our call to worship. This comes from a poem by Amanda Gorman, the National Youth Laureate poet and of course, the uh, young woman who offered the poem at President Biden's inauguration. This comes from a poem called From Our Purpose in Poetry or Earthrise, dedicated to Al Gore and the Climate Reality Project. I'm gonna offer just the last two stanzas of the poem, but I commend the whole poem to you and I'll put a link to it in the chat on all of our chat uh, areas, if I can manage it later. Here we are, the end of Earthrise. So Earth, pale blue dot, we will fail you not. Just as we choose to go to the moon, we know it's never too soon to choose hope. We choose to do more than cope with climate change, we choose to end it. We refuse to lose. Together we do this and more, not because it's very easy or nice, but because it is necessary. Because with every dawn we carry the weight of the fate of this celestial body orbiting a star. And as heavy as that weight sounded, it doesn't hold us down, but it keeps us grounded, steady, ready, because an environmental movement of this size is simply another form of an earth rise. To see it, close your eyes. Visualize that all of us leaders in this room and outside of these walls or in the halls, all of us change makers are in a spacecraft floating like a silver raft in space. And we see the face of our planet anew. We relish the view. We witness its round green and brilliant blue, which inspires us to ask deeply, wholly, what can we do? Open your eyes. 
know the future of this wise planet lies right in sight, right in all of us. Trust this earth uprising, all of us bringing light to exciting solutions never tried before, for it is our hope that implores us at our uncompromising core to keep rising up for an earth more than worth fighting for. I invite you now into our chalice lighting. If you have a chalice or a candle at home that you light on Sunday mornings, this is the time. And if you know the words I will share in a moment, please say them along with me. This morning, I light our chalice for all who dare to hope when the world looks full of despair and for all who hold hope when we ourselves cannot. And I invite you to join me in our chalice lighting words. We gather together as a community of memory and hope to celebrate life and its infinite possibilities for love. We light this chalice as a symbol of the light within every human heart. May our individual sparks meet and merge, bringing both light and warmth to the world. I hope your chalice at home is lit or the chalice in your heart is lit. Maybe just the chalice we always carry in our hands. And now I want to invite especially the children who are watching with us, but truly everyone to be inspired by our Time for All Ages this morning, which is brought to us by teen Sophia Erbaum. Sophia has offered lessons in religious education, so some of our children may recognize her. She also works with our Climate Crisis Action Coalition, and so some of our adults may recognize her. And I think after this, you will agree that we are grateful for what she brings into the world. Our time for all ages. Hey, community. Today, I wanted to come on and talk a little bit about my childhood and stories from that time and how I got into environmentalism and what you can do. So I moved to Beijing, China when I was four years old. And one of the things I remember is that I loved outdoor recess, but it was frequently canceled because there was really bad air quality. At four and five years old, I didn't really get why recess was getting canceled every two weeks or so. But soon I found out about AQI, and that is how they measure air quality. And what they do is they consider carbon monoxide and sulfur dioxide and all sorts of other chemicals and pollutants. And they come up with a number, and if the number is high enough or the air quality is unhealthy enough, then we had to stay inside. All of our classrooms had huge air filters, and the windows were triple sealed. So the air inside was definitely safe. Now, we could normally tell when outdoor recess was gonna get canceled. We looked out the classroom windows and if we couldn't see something 10 feet away from us, then it was pretty likely that we were gonna have to stay inside that day because the air quality was just too dangerous. And when they canceled outdoor recess, a booming voice would come over the intercom and it would say, outdoor recess is canceled, you must stay inside today. But when that didn't happen, we were all really, really excited and happy to go outside. One of our favorite games was called Catch the Plastic Bag. And our school was, was located right next to a huge construction site and a food market and grocery store and all sorts of things. So there were a lot of plastic bags just flying above us. We could look up into the sky and see a gray sky usually, not too blue and a lot of plastic bags. And so we saw that and one day someone suggested just let's just chase the plastic bags. Seems like a really fun game. It's kind of like tag, but with plastic bags. 
My friends and I would all sprint really fast around the concrete playground and we would jump high and get these plastic bags from the sky and then we would just release them back into the sky and our friend would catch the same bag. And a few months later, we decided to catch them and then throw them in the trash can because that was definitely the right thing to do. Something that I wanted to point out that's really important is that while I'm only talking about my time in Beijing 10 or so years ago, all these things are still really important and they impact people from all around the world. Countries that didn't really have problems this big before now had these problems. So now more than ever, it's important to take action. I moved from Beijing to Virginia in fourth grade. And when I moved there, I started doing something called Operation Earthwatch. Operation Earthwatch had a bunch of monthly challenges and each one had books to read and science experiments to do, nature walks to go on and a lot more. And all those activities got me learning a lot more about the environment and made me even more interested. In sixth grade, we moved to Taiwan and that's an island with a ton of beaches. So my family and I would often go on beach cleanups. The shores were just piled in trash and we would stay there for a few hours. And by the time we left, there wasn't much trash, trash remaining. And that was really rewarding. I also started doing debate in middle school. And there I learned about environmental policy and how governments can impact environmentalism. And so I researched all sorts of things like wildlife poaching and oceanic bleaching. And I also really enjoyed that and got even more interested in environmentalism. In 10th grade, I moved back to the US and I joined UUCA. A few months later, I joined the Climate Crisis Action Coalition at UUCA, and there I helped work on the website. Um, and the website has tons of things about what UUCA is doing, what's going on there, and resources on environmentalism and environmental justice. There's also tons of activities that I used in some of my lessons that I did for RE classes that you may have been a part of. I also got involved with Little Friends for Peace which is a local organization that runs Peace Camp at UCA. I tell you all of this just to share my inspirations, where I came from and where I am now. The world needs so many more young leaders in environmentalism as it's really one of the most important issues we're facing today. You can start by doing small things like a carbon footprint calculator with your parents, planting native plants, picking up trash, or just learning more. When the pandemic ends, you can go on protests in DC and demand that really big companies are held accountable for all they do that hurts the environment. You can encourage governments to pass laws that support environmental efforts. No matter what you do, no matter how big or small it is, all of your efforts should be celebrated. I hope you all learned something new today and are feeling ready to take action. I'm so excited to hear more about what all of you do in the future. Bye. Sophia, thank you so much for offering that time for all ages. Sophia was actually the guest presenter at one of my younger daughter's first Sunday school classes at UUCA. And we heard all about what she learned that day. I'm so grateful for the multi-generational connections that a congregation like UUCA offers. Moving right along on multi-generational connections, I invite you, inspired by Sophia's words and by her actions and her life, I invite you to take a breath into the music brought by another of our teens, Kate Marston. Hello, I'm Kate Marston and I'm a senior at Yorktown and I'll be performing You, You, You by Field Medic.
Thank you so much for bringing us into a space of quiet and connection with that beautiful piece. This morning, we are reflecting on where we find hope in our world as we think about the reality of climate change. And this reflecting comes after a tumultuous and difficult week. Many of us spent Tuesday afternoon on the edge of our seats, waiting to hear the verdict in the trial of Derek Chauvin and weeping tears of relief that justice was served even this single time. And our tears cleared, perhaps we saw the news of the killing by police of Makia Bryant in Columbus, Ohio, Tuesday afternoon. It can be be hard to hold hope. We must also, in our times of quiet and prayer, hold space for grief, for rage, for joy, for fear, for our own sorrows and happinesses, the ones that will never make headlines, but that guide our days. We just marked National Infertility Awareness Week a reminder of the quiet sorrows so many of us bear. We are still losing loved ones to COVID, even as others seem to be charging toward back to normal. You have, I am sure, your own list, your own heart sorrows and heart joys. I want to take a moment to invite you to share those in the chat, if you're watching on Zoom or Facebook, YouTube or Vimeo, or to share them with a friend watching with you, or simply name them in your own heart. Remember that UUCA's pastoral care team is here for you during our drop-in hours or at pastoral care at uucaba.org. As you share with each other, as you name in your own heart, your joys and sorrows, I invite you to take another breath, another centering, and to be brought into that centering, that space of meditation, of peace and connection by Christoph Shore another of our teens. If you feel comfortable, please close your eyes. And if you don't, that's okay. Just focus your eyes on a spot on the wall in front of you. Try to find a comfortable sitting position with your hands in your lap or on your knees. And take several deep grounding breaths. In and out. If you're indoors, visualize the outside. Bring your awareness to your
we are working on that video, I invite you to just continue those breaths for a moment as Christoph invited us in. And as we do so, I notice all that is shared in the chat. Colleagues lost to COVID. Hope for a friend waiting for a difficult diagnosis. Caring for so many that we hold dear. I think let's move at this time into our spirit of life music. Take another breath. I hope we may move back into Christoph's meditation later in our service or share it afterward. For now, let the spirit of life wash over us. Sophia, thank you so much for that. And isn't it just what things are these days as we navigate our way through technology and challenges and stay connected through it all? I am so appreciative of your beautiful music, Sophia. Sebastian getting us there with our breaths. And now for what we will hear from some of our other teens this morning. As you As likely know, Earth Day was this past Thursday. In fact, this year is the 51st anniversary of Earth Day. And I think sometimes about the optimism of the founders of the day in 1970 and wonder what they would think today or whether they knew already even then that we as a globe might ignore warning after warning 
until we found ourselves here in 2021 on the brink of a changed earth. Sometimes when I think about climate change, I feel it is just so big, I am not sure where even to begin. I feel that way when I am set to preach on it, I will tell you now. And so our service and the sermon today feel a little bit like divine intervention, or at least like the universe conspiring for good. When I met with our teen group this year to talk about their hopes for participating in a worship service, they decided they weren't quite up for the lift of a full service on their own during virtual times, which frankly, solidarity. So we talked about the services planned and it was this Sunday, this celebration of Earth Day, this articulation and wondering of where hope might be found in the climate crisis that captured their imagination. And it's not surprising, I think. These teens are coming of age into a world that requires action, theirs and ours and those of the children that will come after. And so as we talked about this service, we thought about oh, all parts of this climate change conversation about the importance of individual action, but the ultimate need for collective action, about guilt and where that moved us and where it got us stuck, about how we get ourselves personally and as a congregation and as a country and as a world out of stuckness and into movement, into possibility, and about all the possibility around us. And so out of that conversation came several reflections that we'll share with you this morning, and a relief for me that all I need to do is weave together some of their wisdom. And then another stroke of luck, an article in last Sunday's Washington Post magazine by staff reporter David Montgomery called The Search for Environmental Hope. Just like Amanda Gorman's full Earthrise poem, I commend the whole article to you. David Montgomery lost his brother and niece in a mudslide attributable in part to climate change, making this huge problem feel deeply intimate and heartbreaking. And so he reached out to poets and scientists, naturalists to learn where they find hope, whether hope is even possible in this moment of climate change reality. I want to share some of those thoughts with you. But first, we'll begin with reflections from our own Max Kepler who speaks about an unusual source of hope, the pandemic and our response to it. Hello and good morning. My name is Max Kapler and I'm a senior in the youth group. Right now, I'm about a month away from finishing high school and about two from graduating and stepping out into the world. Let's talk about the world, shall we? After all, it is Earth Day, which has never been more important. Climate change is ravaging the planet, and most of it is our fault. The blame rests solely on our shoulders. However, climate change, I think, really isn't on people's minds currently. We cause climate change, but our attention is focused on the pandemic, a very human problem. Our world is the daily reality of quarantine, masks, and vaccines. But over the horizon is one of humanity's greatest ever challenges. <clears throat> the grimly funny part is that a retreat last March away from schools and workplaces has actually done wonders for the environment. Pollution and smog dropped dramatically in neighborhoods all over the world. People could see birds and animals where they had disappeared. Last Easter, I was walking around my neighborhood and saw groups of rabbits chasing each other around. With quarantine, the earth was brought stillness that I think it desperately needed. This came with a great loss to us, as so many people lost loved ones, opportunities, and security in their daily lives. And now, as people receive vaccines, schools and workplaces reopen, we slowly begin our return to normalcy that drives climate change. 
We've lost that stillness and quiet and returned to our normally fast-paced lives. Whether you think this is an acceptable trade-off is up to you. My point is that we are in constant conflict with our environment. Our success in developing into a highly advanced industrial society results in climate change and environmental destruction, and our pandemic nightmare results in a brief break for the planet. That conflict is the reason that progress on climate change is slow, because we simply aren't good at sacrificing for our long-term benefit. It's also the reason we suffered so badly in the pandemic, because a large group of the population wasn't willing to give up what they had for their long-term benefit. This disheartens me at times, because beating climate change requires sacrifice on a large scale, some of the largest in human history. We cannot simply afford to live the way that we do today. However, I'm constantly reminded that we are capable of such things, because even now, I see a community rallied around staying safe and preventing the spread of COVID-19. I had to drive out an hour and a half just to get a vaccine. The demand is so strong around here. And all of you watching at home have given up a large part of the community we have at church to protect each other. COVID and climate change couldn't be more different, but I see a lot of parallels between the two. Both are pressing issues that need our immediate attention, and both of them require giving up aspects of our lives that we might consider essential. To survive both, we need to move away from our busy and chaotic lives and move towards a different kind of stillness and quiet. It certainly won't be easy, but if the pandemic proves anything, it is that we are able to is that we are willing to endure difficult times in hope of, in hope of a better world ahead of us. That gives me personally a lot of hope. Happy Earth Day and stay safe out there. Thank you very much. I so appreciate Max's clarity on both our failure to make large scale change, our unwillingness as a global society and perhaps particularly as a country to sacrifice what is needed for lasting policy change on climate and his belief that we can do it if we choose to, that we can and have done hard things together, even during this pandemic, and that we can do it again, that we can make that choice again. Varshini Prakash, the co-founder and executive director of Sunrise Movement, which is working for a Green New Deal in the United States, says this in the Post article. The hope honestly comes from the action that I both see myself and those around me taking on a daily basis. The reporter David Montgomery takes this further. When hope is redefined as action, I realized, it can be uncoupled from the need for a guarantee of success. The doing is its own justification and reward. And that just might lead to success. Throughout the article, different thinkers reflect on their own very personal connections to climate change and to the earth. They think about what is needed on a global scale to make change. As Montgomery says, a sense of hope alone is not the victory we're going for. It must be channeled into significant efforts to carbonize the economy, which will require a society-wide sense of resolve, end quote. This was a big part of the conversation that I had with the youth group that, that we can't just make our individual choices, but we need to be part of a movement, part of something bigger, part of a global change. But that global change may still be rooted in our own experiences and choices. Our teen Sebastian Fugel will share more on this idea of the connection between the global and the personal. Climate change is not your responsibility to fix. Over the past half century, there has been a tight knit group of action and solidarity that can be seen among the many environmental groups and movements. However, to the public, the association with climate change is always one of guilt. Guilt over what you could be doing, what you should be doing, it's counterproductive. 
While guilt would allow you to justify, say, buying a Tesla for the environment, it does very little to actually encourage change on its own. And that's because change is so nebulous, so out there. How can one little person do something so big? In truth, you can't fix climate change all by yourself. It's not your sole responsibility to either. It's one of those vastly complex problems that require years and years of unwinding tight knots of production that have led us to this present day problem. Take a moment to find yourself in a New England dining room. Think Massachusetts or maybe Maine. You're in the dining room of someone's home. The walls are painted with a bland yet tasteful eggshell coat and the lamp in the corner leans slightly. In the middle of this room is this family heirloom a beautiful wooden table with arched, neatly engraved chairs that have seated generations after generation. It's sturdy walnut. The setting for many late night conversations, peals of laughter, solemn moments. It's a much different table than the one that recently arrived a few houses down. A Target brand aluminum table with white and gray marbled flimsy plastic something you might see filling a cafeteria on bingo night. It would only be three years before this plastic table breaks when somebody leans too hard for an arm wrestling competition. It was never built to last after all, just quickly put together on a conveyor belt and shipped across the world. That plastic table isn't the only example of this dying way of life. It used to be that furniture, cars, appliances were built to last. Systems constructed as a parent would for a child, filled with care, the attention to pass on the goods to their loved ones. Plastic tables, burnished aluminum, thin plywood houses. These aren't things to pass on to your children, your, your loved ones. They're things to discard, to leave behind. Just like the heirloom, we can build things to last. My mission for this congregation is that when you are making something, as you're designing it, polishing it, testing it out, think to yourself if you're building it to last. Are you cutting corners? Is there a proper way to do this? The more we build our own houses, cars, families to last, the longer we will be able to share the memories of sunset walks in the park, long summer drives, and more dinners over the same walnut heirloom table. So when you build, when you bring forth into the world, build it to last. Thank you. Sebastian, thank you so much for that. I was transported to that New England dining room. I can see it in my mind's eye. And I love the, the way that Sebastian invites us to think about building to last, perhaps not just tables, but also systems. He talks about unwinding tight knots of production, the work that is needed to take the system we live in now, the economic system, the global manufacturing system, and to shift it to a system that is sustainable, one that is built to last the whole way we exist on the earth. Amid the calls for individual action, the idea that climate change is our personal problem, which it both is and isn't. And listen, I heed those calls. We compost, we swapped out lighting fixtures for LED. We bought our Subaru because it came for a zero waste facility. Those actions, whether they lead to change or not, they do feel important because they are right actions or as right as we can get within the system we find ourselves. But even with those individual actions, Sebastian reminds us by telling us climate change is not your problem to solve, you individual. He reminds us that real change will come from policies on a national and global scale that radically change the system, the infrastructure, the transportation we use. And wonders invites us to have the will as a congregation, as a country, as the world to make those changes. 
paradoxically, as we think about the large scale changes needed, it somehow comes back to the most individual, the most personal and intimate when we think about finding that will toward change. In talking with poets and naturalists, the reporter David Montgomery connects with the poet Naomi Shihab Nye, who writes, as humans, we have to ask ourselves, what is within my reach? What could I help change myself? And then he connects with J. Drew Lanham, the author of The Home Place, Memoirs of a Colored Man's Love Affair with Nature. Lanham writes this, part of our job beyond the science that we do as writers and creators is to make the message relevant, to help others understand what it means. And when people can touch something, when they can feel something, then they are moved more to act especially for people of color, for black folks, for indigenous peoples. These things come together in this way that devastates us. Lanham goes on, climate change is not some big word that's far away for big white polar bears. It's an essential thing that is close by for little black and brown boys and girls who have asthma rates, asthma at rates far higher than the majority. In his book, The Home Place, Lanham advocates growing things, even a pot on your windowsill or your balcony or your stoop. He says, you have produced green that's capturing carbon in some way. You have put your hands in soil. Lanham's advice isn't about the idea that this green plant you've grown is gonna change the world. It's about how the green thing you grow changes you, changes your will, your connection to the world around you. I think maybe this is where our faith, where Unitarian Universalism has a part to say in the hope that we can feel even amidst the reality of climate change. Our connection to the interdependent web of life. I think we're going to hear about that and perhaps feel it in a poem that Kate Marston will share with us this morning. We're so glad to have Kate with us here live to share that poem. The poem I am in a, <clears throat> the poem I'm about to read is by Mary Oliver, a favorite poet of my mom and now myself. I remember the chilly January day in 2019 when I heard the news that Mary Oliver had died. I remember sitting in my environmental science class, thinking about how the uninspiring teacher had failed to include the beauty of nature in her curriculum. Mary Oliver's poetry has put that beauty back into nature for me. And I hope that through this poem, you'll be reminded of that beauty too. Some questions you might ask by Mary Oliver. Is the soul solid like iron? Or is it tender and breakable like the wings of a moth in the beak of an owl? Who has it and who doesn't? I keep looking around me. The face of the moose is as sad as the face of Jesus. The swan opens her white wings slowly. In the fall, the black bear carries leaves into the darkness. One question leads to another. Does it have a shape like an iceberg, like the eyes of a hummingbird? Does it have one lung like the snake or the scallop? Why should I have it and not the anteater who loves her children? Why should I have it and not the camel? Come to think of it, what about the maple trees? What about the blue iris? What about all the little stones sitting alone in the moonlight? What about roses? and lemons and their shining leaves. What about the grass? Kate, thank you so much. What about the grass? I am with you. The science and the statistics 
may inspire the specific change that we advocate for in our country and in the world, but it is the poetry. It's the walks in the woods. It's rolling ourselves out into a park. It's our connection with the world around us. It's the blades of grass that inspire our heart toward that action. I'm so grateful for the ways we are reminded that we are not on the earth, but part of it. Grateful for how that spurs us toward collective action. I'm grateful even for the way that that connection to the earth allows a sense of loss in the face of climate change. David Montgomery closes his article in that space, noticing that even the despair that he sometimes feels is itself a way of honoring our connection to the earth and an inspiration for not naive optimism, but rather hope that is grounded in reality. The loss that we feel when we imagine climate change, that loss itself tells us what the earth is to us and what we are to the earth and inspires us to take action. If we can feel deeply the, the fear and loss we can feel deeply the blade of grass and the soul it contains. If we can feel deeply the hope in our collective action, the possibility that we can create a sustainable culture, one built to last, then we have a chance, as Amanda Gorman put it, of rising up for an earth that is more than worth fighting for. Thank you so much to our teens for sharing with us. We'll make sure that Sebastian's full meditation is shared online so that you can relax into that space. I'm sorry, Christoph's full meditation is shared online. And thank you, Max and Sebastian and Kate. Sometimes for me, it is music that reminds me most deeply of the poetry of nature and the way we are connected to it. And so I invite you to join in singing what I know is a favorite hymn for many of us. Lori will sing it for us, but I hope that you sing along at home loud enough that your computer reminds you that you are on mute. Blue Boat Home. Bye. 
Thank you so much, Lori. I hope all of us were swaying with the music. I find it actually not possible to stay just uh, straight up and down in my seat while that music is going. So I hope that you swayed and sang to the hymn as well. As the slide we just saw hinted at, this is the time for our collection, for our offering. Starting this Sunday and ending on Saturday, May 22nd, 70% of our offering will be given to APAC, the Arlington Food Assistance Center. Since 1988, the Arlington Food Assistance Center remains dedicated to its simple but critical mission of obtaining and distributing groceries directly and free of charge to people living in Arlington, Virginia, who cannot afford to purchase enough food to meet their basic needs. The money that we donate to AFAC will help them to help the people of Arlington. There are many ways to pledge. You'll see on the slide in a moment through our website by text, the Give Plus app, by mailing a check. Please put plate in the memo line. As you're making your donations, remember that 30% goes to the continuing mission of UUCA and 70% goes directly to people in need through AFAC. I invite you to give generously. Consider adding a little extra to your gift this week as we seek to support all those of us in Arlington who experience food insecurity. As our offering words remind us, let us be grateful when we are able to give, for many do not have that privilege. Let us be grateful for those who share their gifts with us for we are enriched by their giving. Let us be grateful even for our needs so that we may learn from the generosity of others. Friends, I am indeed grateful for your generosity for all of the ways that you give. One of those is in your singing. So I invite you now to enjoy our choir's music as we give to our community. in resources, we give in music, and we give in our time and the care we show to the children in this community. 
It is always a great joy to hear from our youth to receive their wisdom. And I've seen so many comments this morning of folks appreciating the opportunity to do that. These youth have been nurtured within the congregation, taught by so many of you. And so today we want to thank the teachers, particularly this year, when teaching looked very different than it has any other year. And when our incredible RE volunteers have continued forward, we offer a thanks to them today. Thank you for our I like, what I like about RE is that the teachers are very nice um, and I get to see all my friends and my favorite session was the imagination session. Thank you to all the RE teachers at UCA and Miss Leanne Williams and the UCA team for helping us to grow. We appreciate all the time and effort that you make for us. Thank you so much for working throughout the pandemic. And thank you especially for Ben and I, to Mr. Ed McGrady, Mr. Steve Tricky, and Ms. Suzanne for making our makerspace lessons fun and enriching and for holding off on setting things on fire. In, In spite, spite of everything, everything it has been, been a great year. year. Thank, thank you very much. Um, I'm thankful for the fifth grade and sixth grade teachers for introducing me to coding and scratch. What has been your favorite part about RE, Nora? Um, 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 uh, uh, um, a reading book. Anything else? Yes, so. Bye. Good morning, friends. Leanne here. I just wanted to take a few moments today and say thank you to all of our children's RE, youth advisor, and adult faith development volunteers who supported our lifelong learning program over this past church year. Thank you so much for fearlessly leading in new and innovative ways and for holding space during these emerging times. Please know all of you UCA, we all thank you. Hi, it's Marcella and Joanna. And we just wanted to say thank you to all of our RE teachers this year. I had a great time in neighboring phase this year. I learned a lot of new things. And I loved learning in my class about curiosity, imagination, and everything we learned about. So we just want to say thank, thank you. you. I really like RE because um, we do fun things in it. Like I kind of liked when we did the experiments with stuff like soap and we put it in the salt and, and yeah. Thank you for doing RE. Bye. Hi, I'm Alex Kerr. I'm in fifth grade. I would just like to thank Miss Leanne Williams and Miss Annie Parker for running the UUCA fourth and fifth graders book club. I really enjoyed the social time with the kids and the teachers. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barry! Thank you, Ari teachers. For all you do. Ari, Ari is, is so, so much, much fun. fun. Hi everybody, Leanne here again, and I just want to say a special thank you to Christina um, and thank her for leading our youth group in the past year as you leave us here at UUCA and go on to pursue your own dreams and goals. Just again, thank you for holding space for our youth and our advisors during these emerging times. It required you to be super creative, flexible, and fearless and our whole community owes you a debt of gratitude. Yeah, hi, I'm Jane Tricky, one of the youth here at UCA. 
And we've been really lucky to have Christina with us for the past year. And we just want to take this opportunity to thank her for everything she's done. Christina, thank you. Do we have, oh, there we go. Good luck, Christina. We wish you well. It's been a great year and a half. So thank you for sticking with us <laughs> as we rode this roller coaster together. Christina, thank you so much. I know we are all sending you good wishes. Christina has big next steps in life as she heads off eventually to medical school. And we are really, really glad that we were part of her journey. Um, and many thanks to the teens who um, have been uh, sharing some, some signed thank yous that I think are going to get to Christina later. We're so glad. Thank you to all of our teachers and to our amazing staff as well who have been supporting RE this year. In addition to Christina, Annie Parker, and Leanne Williams. I will tell you that um, our, our RE program always and our RE program, particularly during these very wacky virtual times, um, is a real joy. It is incredible that our, our congregation has been able to, to move this forward. I'm so grateful uh, as a parent as well as um, serving this congregation. So thank you. I see lots of thanks in the chat and appreciations. And I also saw in the chat uh, here in Zoom that the hope that we are finding today is indeed in the voices of our young people and our children. That as we gather together looking toward the future, we know we are called toward action and that our connection with the earth and with the world is shared by those who come after. So whatever age you are watching, I hope that today you find a soul in a blade of grass. I hope that today you create something, something you hold in your hands or something you feel in your heart that is built to last. I hope today that you are inspired to remember, we can do hard things. And I hope all together, we make the choices that lead to true hope for our earth. May it be so, amen. <laughs>